The end of a superpower? With America in decline, does the future now belong to China? And where do the world's emerging powers fit in the new pecking order? Hello and welcome to Bigger Than Five with me, Rida Fakhri. On this new weekly program, we look at the shifting dynamics in a new world order that goes beyond the influence of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. And we begin right here in Washington, D.C., where Donald Trump's America First policies, isolationism and withdrawal from multilateral agreements are undermining the United States' global standing. And with China on the rise, are we on the cusp of a new era? The walls we are building are not medieval walls. They are smart walls. Until we can have a wall and proper security, we're going to be guarding our border with the military. A very important a space achievement for China. It became the first country ever to put a probe on the dark side of the moon. At this very moment, large, well-organized caravans of migrants are marching toward our southern border. Some people call it an invasion. It's like an invasion. I hope we could make it a deal. It's already challenging the U.S. as the world's biggest economy, and now China is extending its strategic and commercial influence through the creation of a giant trading network known as the New Silk Road. The obstructionist Democrats would like us not to do it, but believe me, we have to close down our government. We're building that wall. China is leading the way in innovation. They're investing in computer science. They're investing in startups. And I think that's who we're going to see the challenges from in terms of who controls AI, transportation, all kinds of things that are critical. China is the competition. And we're talking about national security. This isn't just a border. This is national security. This is health and wellness. This is everything. So how well has the America First agenda served the United States? We're joined by Corey Lewandowski, a former campaign manager for Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Corey Lewandowski, you are a strong supporter of the America First policy. You've, you've said in the past that the U.S. should not lead from behind the way the previous administration has done, that this president is leading the world, quote, as it's supposed to be done. How exactly is he leading the world when he is closing the U.S. off alienating it from many of its allies, isolating it, pulling out of many major international agreements, building a wall when others are actually building strategic alliances. Well, look, first you have to ask, how is the U.S. leading? The U.S. is leading by going to our allies around the world and saying, we can't be not only the policeman of the world, but the piggy bank of the world. And what we've seen is $100 billion of more money into the international community from those countries around the world that weren't paying their fair share. And while the United States is a rich country, we're also a debtor country. We've got $22 trillion in debt. Doesn't it mean that you're actually pursuing the wrong economic policies? Let's face it. President Trump wants to spend $21 billion on building the wall. That's according to the latest estimates by the National uh, Homeland Security Department. It doesn't make sense to be spending so much on a wall to be creating essentially a national emergency crisis when many people believe none exists. Well, I, you have to ask yourself, what's the value of an American life? And if you want to ask Officer Singh, who was killed by a person who was deported multiple times, or, or Kate Steinle in California, and so many others, we could go through the stories. Do you know as what well as I do value? that the crime rate is down That's at the true. border? I mean, That's not true. Uh, just look, look at the facts. Today, let's look a at the study facts published, today. I'll give you some of the facts. A study published in the journal Criminology shows that the more that undocumented immigrants are a share of the population, the less crime there is in the overall population. If walls don't Cato, work, why did Syria Cato, and Turkey build on their own border? Let me just mention this. Cato, a libertarian Institute says this, uh, there is no justification to build a wall. In, in fact, they believe that crime is lower along the 23 counties along the U.S.-Mexico border than it is inland. That's, that's absolutely not true. What we know for sure is that people come back and forth across the border illegally all the time. We know that they're deported. They make their way back to Mexico. They come back in and they kill Americans. Now, maybe that's acceptable in other countries, but we're a sovereign nation. And no Okay, well, you talk about global leadership, don't you? You've said that this president is exerting American dominance on the world stage and reminding everybody of how great a superpower we are. This is no longer a unipolar world, you'd agree. 
that the U.S. controls. And if anything, uh, Trump seems to be speeding up the U.S.'s global demise by chipping away at the established world order. Other countries are forging ahead. They're investing in renewable energy. They're investing in artificial intelligence. They are creating the kinds of alliances that push them forward politically, economically. Take China, take Russia. Let's take China. They steal our intellectual property every chance they get, right? The reason that their market is now collapsing is because this president's been tough on China for the first time in a generation. We've got a 500 billion dollar trade deficit with China alone on a yearly basis. And you know why? Because they don't give us access to their market share. When we do put American products there, you know what they do? They steal the intellectual property, they subsidize their own products, they, and they dump them on the U.S. soil at the cost of the American taxpayer. It's unacceptable. It's not fair, and we won't stand for it. But again, that's not true. It's Trump 100% true. tariffs on China to reduce the trade deficit. That was one of his major campaign promises. He wanted to discourage the U.S. buyer from actually purchasing goods from China, the opposite happened. The latest data shows that the U.S. has been importing more, not less, from China. It also shows that the trade gap between the two widened last year by over $43 billion. Of course it widened because they still don't from allow China our products are in. actually increasing. That's, that's U.S. Right. exports are, are falling. How be, do you explain be, that? Because Chinese companies are subsidized by the Chinese government. That's a fact. Look at the steel industry. Look at the aluminum industry. They are subsidized. And then what they do is they dump their products on U.S. soil. Think of uh, major manufacturers of appliances that are made in China. They're dumped on our soil. And then you know what has to happen? We buy those products because Americans love cheap goods and we can't compete. So you're saying that the trade tariffs have failed? No, what I'm saying is you have to let them work. And here's what we know. We're the hottest economy in the world right now. Six, six million new jobs since the president's been elected. China, China's economy, where are they growing? 1.2, 1.3%. What's the growth rate of the American economy right now? Even in a bad time, our real, real wage growth is the highest it's been in 10 years, 3.4% real wage growth. If you look at it since Donald Trump's been in office, under Barack Obama, we were growing at 1.2%. 1.3%. Well, unemployment create... was already down under Obama in his last year. It was down to 4.8. Now it's gone down further under Trump. But that trend has begun under Obama. Unemployment is at 3.8%. It has nothing to do with Barack Obama. It's because the tax policies that this president has put in place to incentivize small and big businesses alike to reinvest into our country. Well, let's talk about the U.S. as a superpower, because you say that we want to remind everybody of how great a superpower we are. How important is it then for the United States, for the word of this president, to be credible, to be taken seriously, because the Washington Post counted at least a thousand instances where this president lied. What has Trump done to make American foreign policy great again? Just give me one achievement. Uh, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Since this president has started having a conversation in North Korea, we have not seen one test-fired missile, unlike the previous administration, not once. How then do you explain that on the heels of President Trump's visit to Hanoi and his meeting with Kim Jong-un, it was announced that actually the, the main rocket launch site has been rebuilt and that we are to expect another rocket launch anytime soon. So clearly well, Kim Jong-un doesn't when, think when that Trump that has since been negotiating from the position of, of, of strength. Since the he? president has started a discussion with North Korea, not one test-fired missile has been launched since the president met the first time in North, with let me North take, Korea. Let me take you up on another point you made. You said the U.S. is not interested in being the world's policeman. Why then is the U.S. intervening in Venezuela? Well, look, there's two places. Venezuela and Syria both have brutal dictators that have used uh, imitation in, in, uh, tactics. They've used weapons against their own people. And look, am I an interventionist? The answer is no. But sometimes when the U.S. is leading 50 countries around the world, to ask for Maduro to step down and to leave and to go to a beach somewhere, that should take the world by nose because we were the first country to call for but, that. But it I, wasn't France, you were, it wasn't you were Germany, indeed, it wasn't Great Britain. You were, and when it came time to holding Bashir al-Assad accountable for chemical weapons and nuclear weapons... On Syria, clearly, this president has flip-flopped. Two months ago, he wanted U.S. troops to pull out immediately. Then it was, let's have a gradual withdrawal. And now let's, it's, let's keep a few hundred people stationed there, soldiers. But let's, let's really pick on what you said about Venezuela. I, I wonder how you counted an achievement uh, to call on the democratically elected leader of a country to step down, to push for uh, a military option, if need be, for regi regime change. I mean, certainly, we haven't said certainly you would agree, option. but you, you've, you've hinted at one. Uh, We've do you used think economic it's, do you, sanctions do you to think hold it's any coincidence that Venezuela just happens to be sitting on the largest proven oil reserves in the world? 
The United States just today announced that we are now the largest oil exporter in the world, larger than Saudi Arabia, larger than, we are the largest exporter of energy. So we don't care about Venezuela's oil. It has nothing to do with oil. Even Please. if that is true, the price of oil is an international one. So whoever controls oil fields in the world matters greatly, doesn't it? Let me just ask you this. You've said many times in the past and here today that President Trump cares about America's interests. When you look at climate change, is he really putting America first? Because just looking again at the recent surveys, 69% of Americans say that they are worried about global warming. In fact, a growing number of Americans, including most Republicans, now say that they believe that climate change is happening, which is a clear shift. Can you deny that this president is out of step with a good chunk of the electorate in this country? That's not true. See, here's the thing. The, the great thing about statistics are you can use them any way you want, but the reality is at the ballot box. And if you were going to present me a series of facts and statistics uh, the day before the election, you would have all but assured me Hillary Clinton was going to win a record landslide. But the truth was Donald Trump won the largest margin of the Electoral College since Ronald Reagan's re-election campaign in 1988. So every statistic was wrong. Every polling data was wrong. So I don't believe your polling data. I don't well, believe it's that 69. Mine. It's American so, so polling data, and I think it's credible Which polling enough. company? Many of them. Which one? I, Ipsos, for one. I mean, that's a credible polling company. The same is one it? that said Donald Trump will lose by it, seven points? Well, if it, didn't, if it didn't suit your purposes, doesn't mean it's not credible, is it? Let me just ask you finally about these uh, new moves within Congress, certainly among Democrat uh, members of con Congress, Democratic members of Congress, who are pushing for the impeachment of this president. Do you think this is something that is likely to happen? And how do you see President Trump doing in the next two years? No, I think the Democrats will absolutely move to impeach President Trump. It will be, uh, they will have that recourse at the ballot box in 2020. Uh, there is no thing, there is nothing uh, to impeach him for other than fighting for America and putting America first. If that's a crime, then guilty is charged. Corey Lewandowski, thank you very much indeed. And still ahead on the program, has the United States lost its superpower status? and who will fill the leadership void. America's position as the world's leading economy is being challenged by several Asian countries with China soon poised to overtake the United States. New emerging economies like India and Indonesia are also expected to be among the world's top four by 2030. So will the race among nations be determined by the size of their economy, their military, their geostrategic alliances, or something entirely different? Anna Rold, publisher of The Diplomatic Courier and professor at Northeastern University, gives us her take in The Big Idea. My belief is, is that the new geopolitical struggle is going to be completely in the digital sphere. Whether that's AI, blockchain, cryptocurrency, any of the new emerging technologies, whoever has figured out how to use those new technologies in the physical realm is going to get in ahead of the game in the, in the new pecking order. Think about it in terms of the moonshot, you know, when we were all racing to who was going to land on the moon first. Right now, we're seeing a very different kind of race. It's not just symbolic in nature, but it also has uh, huge implications in defense, in culture, society at large. Um, there's about 18 countries that have um, national artificial intelligence strategies. Canada has a plan, India has a plan, um, and there's several other countries in Europe. You know, as a, uh, Europe as a bloc has several countries that are working uh, towards this. But then the question becomes, you know, what about emerging economies? Not everybody can afford to. For example, you know, African countries. The answer that I would have for those countries, they can't afford not to be part of this. Maybe they won't have the same uh, capacity to invest the way the United States and other superpowers or global powers are, are investing. At the, but at the same time, there are global dialogues going on where developing countries can participate in, especially when it comes to how we govern uh, AI. And this will eventually become a very big issue at the United Nations and other international forums. In an attempt to play catch up, the Trump administration recently launched an AI initiative. But the U.S. continues to lag behind on many other fronts. Aus Haidari has our five facts. America's share of global wealth is shrinking. At the end of World War II, the United States accounted for half of the world's economic output. By 1985, it had fallen to 22.5%. Today, it stands at 15.1% and the IMF projects that will slip to 13.7% by 2023. By comparison, China's share has been steadily rising overtaking the U.S. in 2013 
and is expected to break the 20% mark by 2023. National debt in the United States stood at nearly 22 trillion by the end of 2018, more than 2 trillion higher than when President Donald Trump took office. The total debt stands at 78% of the country's GDP. That's the highest it has been since 1950. The U.S. has the highest income inequality of all rich countries. In 1980, the bottom 50% of the U.S. population had more than 20% share of the national income, while the top 1% had just over 10% share. Over time, that trend reversed. Today, the top 1% controls more than 20% of the national income, while the bottom 50% has only 13. More than 40 million Americans live in poverty. The U.S. has one of the highest poverty rates among wealthy nations at 12.3% of the population, which means more than 40 million Americans are living below the poverty line. U.S. academic achievement and healthcare access lagging behind. Internationally, the U.S. stands 24th out of 71 countries in science and 38th in math. As for healthcare quality and access, the U.S. ranks 29th in the world behind most countries in Europe. The U.S. under Trump has also been gradually losing its political clout and influence on the world stage. In this new multipolar world, how is the U.S. president's approach to foreign policy affecting America's global standing? And who will fill the new leadership void left by the United States? Joining me now are Vali Nasser, Dean of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and Senior Fellow in Foreign Policy at Brookings Institution, and Fred Flights, President and CEO of the Center for Security Policy. He recently served as Deputy Assistant to President Trump and Chief of Staff to National Security Council Advisor John Bolton. Fred Flights, looking at the U.S. standing on the world stage, a domestically weakened Donald Trump went all the way to Hanoi to meet with a North Korean leader. He came back empty-handed. Many people argue he came back demeaned. To what extent was this miscalculation? Was it failed brinkmanship, or is it further proof of the U.S.'s decline on the world stage? Well, it's good to be here, and I agree with what you said about the rising power of China, but I completely dispute the whole thesis of this panel. I think we're learning from Donald Trump that uh, a, a, a weak and indecisive United States, which we had under Barack Obama, is extremely destabilizing. President Trump has reversed that by being a decisive president with, with the use of force on the table. How has, he's gotten how rid has of the he terrible, reversed that? Because he's gotten he, rid of the terrible nuclear deal the with one, Iran. Uh, forgive me to interject, but he is the one who started the whole war rhetoric with the North Koreans. Exactly, and that Obama. rhetoric got the North Koreans to the table, lowered tensions with North Korea, stopped its nuclear missile test, and I have to say the president's decision to walk away from the table in Vietnam was an act of leadership that showed the North Koreans we will only settle for a good deal. I think we came out looking very good from the Vietnam summit. Do you agree, Vali Nasser? Did the U.S. come out looking very good? Uh, many people would argue that no progress was made whatsoever, that President Trump actually came back empty-handed. Well, I How think the, the certain taboos were broken, like the meeting of the heads of state. But I think the expectation for that there would actually be a deal was never realistic. North Koreans were not going to give up their entire strategic asset in one meeting in exchange for just uh, economic uh, relief, which the U.S. could reimpose at any moment after they'd given up their, their nuclear deal. So President Trump basically set himself up for this outcome. You might say that uh, it's a good thing that uh, he didn't agree to something that would have been problematic, but I think going in, people were extremely skeptical, particularly in the region, that this would actually lead to a deal. The but, option but would have been for him to try to uh, arrive at some steps that would have uh, required, would have meant that we, we may give a little bit and they might give a little bit. Shrek Flights, you've been highly critical of the whole Iran nuclear deal that President Trump walked away uh, from. Does the president, though, really know what he is doing? Because when you look around, he seems to be isolated when it comes to Iran. Everyone else is still on board. The Europeans certainly are. That's he not walked true. away from a deal I'm, that everyone I, I, else that still believes true. in. Gulf states are with the president. Israel is with the president. And the, the Gulf point, states were never part of this deal, the, uh, but the Europeans yeah, were, and they still are part Why weren't they part of this deal? They're in the region. You know, when the Clinton administration negotiated the agreed framework, South Korea and Japan were at the table. This deal was negotiated with states thousands of miles away from Iran. Well, not Russia. Russia borders Iran. But regional states weren't included in the deal. The deal was a disaster. It did not significantly stop Iran's nuclear weapons program. The fact that President Trump killed it is one of his biggest achievements as president. Killing it, was that 
because of the whole nuclear threat that Iran represents, Vali Nasser, in your opinion? Or does it speak to something much larger? Does it speak to the U.S. president's willingness to perhaps in some respects do the bidding of the Netanyahu government and their Saudi allies in many respects in the region? Well, ultimately, the Republican Party was never in favor of a deal. But, but the deal should be much bigger than domestic American politics. This is a deal that the United States entered in. It actually reflects the credibility of the United States. Why would the North Koreans sign a deal with any American president if the next president can come in and just undo the deal because he didn't like it. And the deal was actually, it has been verified that Iran has abided by the terms of the deal as was negotiated and signed and then made into a document of the United Nations by the United States. So it makes the United States essentially look like it cuts a deal. It doesn't like the deal after it's cut. It moves out. And then uh, that basically has no credibility to, to agree to other deals. Looking at the, at the bigger uh, geostrategic mm -hmm. picture, is there a consistent U.S. foreign policy to speak of? Because a lot of people looking at this precisely see that the U.S. isn't willing to engage with Iran, but yet is willing to engage with the Taliban, a group that the U.S. has been actively engaged in a war against for the past 17 years. The is US, there the, any consistent The U.S. is US willing to engage with Iran. Iran does not want to engage with the Trump administration because it wants to stick with this incredibly generous deal that the Obama administration agreed to give Iran. And I think it was important that the Trump administration kill this deal, increase sanctions on Iran, and create the environment where someday we can negotiate a meaningful deal that addresses all the threats Iran poses, well, not just clearly a Clearly, the program. Europeans don't agree because they're putting together a mechanism to circumvent the mechani U.S. sanctions. The mechanism is yeah, a joke. Nasser, European you, countries are not... Your take on this. Well, they, they may not be able to implement the mechanism, but it's very clear that the United States is isolated. But, but the United States took a resolution to the United Nations and made this into a binding United Nations document. So it's an international document. The United States was the sponsor of it. This is not coming down to a partisan argument. A Democratic president signed a nuclear deal that a Republican president doesn't like it. If you're sitting out in the world, you would say, you know, why sign a deal with the United States? The next president would come in and say, well, I don't like the nuclear deal that Trump signed. I'm going to reverse it. So we have to show some consistency from president to president on these deals if we're going to have more of them. Some consistency, Fred Fights, uh, beyond uh, the U.S. administration's approach to North Korea and Iran. Would you agree, would you accept the notion that any superpower cannot afford to be erratic? And I think you might agree it's been the hallmark of the the Trump administration. He himself vowed to be unpredictable, and on that, he kept his pledge. The, the president inherited a number of messes around the world, in North Korea concerning Iran, in Iraq, and in Syria, the terrible Paris Climate Accord. He's had a lot of problems to deal with. And, and I think he's plowed through them very carefully with some expert advisors. Uh, my former boss, John Bolton, is one of them. I see you have him be, be behind you there. He's getting expert advice on how to deal with these problems. But I mean, it's been an uphill str struggle. Think of the policy in the Middle East leading from behind, how this encouraged Al Qaeda, how this encouraged rogue states to take advantage of the United States and the Middle East. The president had to reverse this, and it's been tough. Uh, Vali Nasser, is China taking full advantage of this? Is it the case that while Trump continues to make headlines, China is making headway all over the world. Well, the, the, there's a lot of pressure on China on the trade issue, but by, by scuttling P, uh, the, the trade agreement in Asia, we've opened the door for the Chinese now to enter into a very different trade agreement with all the Southeast Asian countries. We also have lost our credibility there, because a lot of countries put a lot of capital into getting that trade deal, and President Trump scuttled it. There's no successor to it. There's no talk of a trade deal. Everything is bilateral uh, with different countries. And, and as a result, you know, there's, a, there's, uh, there's not just unpredictability, there's, there's a belief that the United States is vacating certain arenas and the Chinese are moving into it, the Russians are moving into it. It's actually not true that in the Middle East the threat of, uh, of war is on the table. The U.S. is withdrawing from Syria. The U.S. is withdrawing from Afghanistan. The, the president has made it very clear that he didn't support the, 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 the maximalist positions that the Bush administration took on by going into a war in Iraq. I don't think actually that the, 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 the tough rhetoric necessarily is matched by commitment to being present in large troop numbers in areas of the world or building multilateral uh, um, you know, alliances around, around countries like China or Russia. I think countries like China and Russia are actually feeling a lot of room to maneuver. And the collapse of relations between the United States and Europe is also seen by both the Chinese and Russians as providing them with additional opportunities. So it's a very different world. It may work for, for the Trump administration, 
but, but, but a lot of the cordons that existed around these countries is no longer there. Certainly a vacuum is being created well, and I, many I, are willing I, to jump in. No, we have 10 seconds left. I don't agree with in any 10 of that. Seconds. Well, I'd say in Asia, we're far more credible with Japan, with South Korea. They know we're standing up to China, especially on trade. Uh, I, I, I simply don't agree with that at all. I think that this president is credible and is making a real diff difference in promoting international security. Fred Flights, uh, Vali Nasser, thank, thank you. you both very much indeed. Good to be here. Thank you. So with this shifting geopolitical landscape, the United States is certainly no longer the world's undisputed superpower. China's moment has come, and with the resurgence of Russia on the international stage, other powers are pursuing new strategic alliances. They're also gaining more political and economic influence. By 2030, seven emerging economies, including India, Indonesia, Turkey, South Africa and Brazil, are projected to be among the world's top 10 economic powers. From me, Rida Fakhri, and the entire team here in Washington, thanks for watching. See you next week.